Our scripture this morning is from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It's short, so be sure and listen right from the beginning. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. So happiness, what is it? How do we get ourselves some and how do we hold on to it? I think this is something that we've all had moments in our lives when we have thought about this because we've been wanting a little bit more happiness in our lives. So I decided to go to the internet, the source of all good things. And my children have been teaching me the value of memes. Uh, Those are funny graphics. So um, I looked up happiness memes, and this is what I have to share with you today. Me leaving work today, oops, it looks like our happy slide is going to be hiding behind all of these. Me leaving work today, very happy. (laughs) Next one. Happiness is not having to set your alarm clock for the next day. Happiness is five minutes of peace. Okay, this one has special meaning to me today. Happiness is a drink of cold water after a long run. Yesterday, I went and did a 10K, which was supposed to be 6.2 miles. I walked it. I did not run it. It was a trail race, though, at Kettle Moraine State Park down by Delafield. What I didn't realize, it was 80% hills. (laughs) And very little flat places. And it was hot. And it was really more like seven miles than 6.2. And I know that 0.8 of a mile isn't that much, but boy, did it feel it yesterday. My husband did go with me, and we were just delayed when we got home and we saw all of the rankings of everyone's times. We were not the last ones across the finish line. We also picked a race that the 10K is one loop, and then there was a half marathon, which does two of the loops. So we were finishing as the half marathoners were finishing, so it looked like we were just finishing with everyone else, even though they had gone twice as far as us. But as they were passing us on the route, we could cheer for them and maybe bring some happiness to their lives because we gave them someone to pass along the way. But the drink of cold water was very, very happy inspiring yesterday. Next one. Why are frogs so happy? They eat anything that bugs them. (sighs) Some of us, it takes a little longer. There are all moments that people, these are all moments that make people feel happy. And there are a lot that we could probably all sit down and come up with those little moments of joy that we have had in our lives. But the thing is, most of these are moments that don't last very long. The water that I got at one station, it was a long ways to the next station for more water yesterday. These are short and fleeting moments And the reality is, as the next slide reminds us, to put it mildly, the world is a mess. This week I was thinking about some things that have happened during my lifetime. And I was thinking back to 9-11. I was a young mom at the time. My kids were toddlers and babies. They have no memory of 9-11. And 9-11, for those of us who were around for it, was a terrible, terrible event. And it changed so many things in our lives. It changes the way we go through airports. Uh, It changes all sorts of security things in our lives. But as I was thinking about it, I was remembering that after 9-11, pretty shortly, like while we were still dealing with 9-11, other things started happening. There were those anthrax attacks. You know, anthrax was being sent through the mail. There were postal service workers that were getting affected by it. There were people in offices receiving it. 
And then in the Washington, D.C. area, there were two people driving around in a car as snipers, shooting at people randomly. So not only did we no longer have security going through the airports, now we were scared of our mail, and we were scared of going grocery shopping. We kept thinking, isn't there going to be a moment when things go back to normal, where we can be happy again, where we have some security and stability in our lives? And I was thinking about how, you know, I would have thought that something like that moment was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And then we had a global pandemic, a virus that raced around the world in weeks, affecting the entire world. And just as we were hoping to get back to normal and get back to something regular, war broke out in Ukraine, which upended all sorts of supply chains around the world. And then we had inflation, like we have not had it for a long time. And we are still thinking, can't we get back to normal? Some of us are like, I don't even know what normal is anymore. But there's got to be something better. So today we are looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. And Kay did a great job reading our little passage from us. I just want to say, this is not a book to read by yourself. I know a couple of you started reading when I said we were going to be doing this. This is a pretty sometimes depressing book. The passage that Kay read is not that jump up and, yeah, this is the verse I want to memorize from the Bible and hold on my heart. What is going on here? The writer of Ecclesiastes was a person who looked around the world and saw that it was a mess, just like us. He may have been experienced different messes than we do, but the problem, the fundamental problem was the same. The world was a mess. How do we find meaning? How do we find security and contentment? How do we find peace in our hearts? Now, church tradition is that this was written by King Solomon, that King Solomon wrote the book Song of Songs when he was a young man full of hope and excitement, that he wrote Proverbs while he was in his middle age and is teaching younger people some daily bits of wisdom to use in their lives. And Ecclesiastes was perhaps written at the end of his life as he is looking back, wondering about his legacy, wondering what his life had meant. Where do we find purpose and meaning? Now today, we still often look to older people for wisdom. As I myself am getting older, I'm not feeling any wiser. Anyone who has managed to feel wiser along the way, please come to me and let me know what your secret is. But I would like for us to look into Ecclesiastes a little bit today and see if there is some wisdom that can bring us a little bit more insight on finding the happiness that brings meaning and contentment to our life. So exactly what are we talking about with happiness? Now, in the memes, we really were looking at moments of fleeting happiness, moments of joy, moments of smiling, moments of laughter. But I don't think any of those memes were anything that we could build a life upon. Regretfully, every day is not Friday where we're going to get the weekend off. And I have to say, being a pastor, the weekend doesn't mean the same thing to me <laughs> as it does to others. And I know many of you work on Saturdays and Sundays as well. I think what we're really looking for with happiness is this deeper sense of meaning and contentment, something that is going to last day after day, something that gets us through the ups and the downs of life. If we look at the Bible, there are a couple words in the original languages that are used. In the Old Testament, there's a Hebrew word, shalom. Many of us have been familiar with this word translated as peace into English. But in Hebrew, it really generally has a broader meaning. 
It can cover welfare, health, prosperity, well-being, safety. It, it really is getting to this idea of the wholeness and completeness of a life. The complete package, all put together the way it was meant to be put together. In the New Testament, there's a Greek word, Irene, which is also translated as peace in English. And this is the word that the angels used when they announced Jesus' birth. Peace be unto you. Jesus himself uses this word when he left his followers when he was arrested. My peace I leave with you. Jesus uses this word to greet his disciples after his resurrection. And Paul uses this word to let us know that he believes this is the essence of the, new, of the good news. That this is what Jesus came to bring us. This Irene, this peace and wholeness and completeness. When we look at this broader understanding of these words that are used in our text, I think the meaning of happiness is more than an adrenaline rush or a moment of joy. I think what we're looking for is peace and well-being. The wholeness that God wanted us to have, created us to have. A life of meaning and of purpose. Basically, we have a God who wants us to be happy. Now, a number of years ago, in 1938, some professors at Harvard decided they wanted to research happiness and do a survey, a study of people to see what the secret to a life of happiness really is. So they set up this study survey and they got a group of Harvard students, but they also went around Boston and got a bunch of other young people. They wanted to make sure they had a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds, a variety of life experiences and education levels. For 75 years, Researchers followed these people, checking in every few years, asking how things were going and what brought them happiness in their lives. Basically, these Harvard professors were looking at the same questions that the writer of Ecclesiastes has. There were three things that a lot of people initially thought were going to bring people happiness. Number one, work. Work hard, be happy, right? Ecclesiastes says in chapter 2, we read, I came to hate all my hard work here on earth, for I must leave to others everything I have earned. And who could tell whether my successors will be wise or foolish? Yet they will control everything I have gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, their minds cannot rest. It is all meaningless. Remember that thing how I said you shouldn't read Ecclesiastes by yourself? This is not cheerful reading. But the conclusion we can take from here is that work cannot make us happy because one day it ends. And when it does, no one remembers and no one cares. Now, that is not to say that our work is not valued. There is important work we need to do. But work cannot be the foundation of happiness in our life. It comes, it goes. The work we do will be carried on by someone else and will go in different directions. The second potential source of happiness a lot of people look to is accumulation, getting more stuff. And by stuff, I include money and power and achievements, as well as toys. Ecclesiastes says in chapter 5, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. So what good is wealth, except, perhaps, to watch it slip through your fingers? We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. Who knew you can't take it with you was in the Bible. 
conclusion here is achievements don't satisfy the longing for something more. No matter how great we are, there's always someone better than us. Again, not a great source of happiness. Third thing a lot of people bring up, pleasure. Ecclesiastes says in chapter 2, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? And after much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. Conclusion, there aren't enough parties in the world or bottles of wine to cover up the longing that we feel in our hearts. So this is what Ecclesiastes said, and you want to know something? The Harvard study found the same thing. The people who had pursued accumulation and work and pleasure did not find happiness. There's a TV show that my husband and I have been enjoying, Ghosts on CBS. There's a young couple who find out that some distant relative has died in a big, huge mansion out in the countryside to them. They go take a look at it, decide to quit their jobs in the big city, and turn this place into a and b Along the way, the wife has a near-death experience, and because of that, she can now see the ghosts that also live in this beautiful old house. And there's a fair number of them from a number of different time periods. There's a Viking, there's a Victorian woman, there's someone from the American Revolution, there's a poor dad who got killed as a scoutmaster during archery practice when the arrow went through his neck. Part of the premise of this show is that these ghosts weren't good enough to get into heaven and they weren't good enough to get into hell. So they're just roaming, but they are trapped within a certain radius of where they died. So they can never leave, and they're stuck with everyone else who died who wasn't really good enough or bad enough for all eternity. This last episode that we just watched had a really funny moment in it. There's one ghost who's had his head cut off. And as a prank, one of the ghosts thought he'd search for some pleasure, for some happiness, and he decided to yank the guy's head, and he threw it into the woods, and it got lodged in a hollow tree. So the body was just kind of roaming around without his head, not really knowing where it was or where it was going. The sad thing was, the guy who thought he was going to get pleasure from this great prank well, stuff happened, and he forgot. And it took a year before someone went and found the poor head and let this other poor ghost have his body back together again. And the ghost who did this is like, wow, I didn't get any happiness. I thought this was going to be fun. I thought this was going to make me laugh. I thought in a day or two we'd have a big joke over this. He says, now I just feel terrible. The ghosts have come to realize that they're stuck with each other forever. Now, there is a possibility that one of them really screws up and goes downstairs or finally gets their act together and goes upstairs. But for the moment, they are stuck with each other. They are discovering that living together forever, they have to find ways to get along. And that the happiness they are really enjoying in this ghost life that they are having actually comes as they build stronger relationships with each other. And in the end, that's where the Harvard study ends up, and that's where the writer of Ecclesiastes ends up. No, nothing makes us happy, as in 
no thing will make us happy. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we read, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Years ago, there was a movie called G.I. Jane, and in there, a bunch of recruits are going through Navy SEAL training, and one of the quips that the Navy uses, one of the little mantras to remind people how to be safe in difficult situation is two is one, one is none. Two people can get out of anything, but one person is in trouble. Two is one, one is none. My first year out of college, I was in a program called Lutheran Volunteer Corps. I was doing anti-hunger work in the city of Baltimore, living with other people in this volunteer program. It was kind of like a domestic Peace Corps. And one of my roommates had been working at a Lutheran retreat center called Holden Village in Washington State for the summer. It's high up in the Cascade Mountains. It's beautiful and glorious, but it's the Cascade Mountains, and it can snow any month of the year. And at the end of July, on her day off, she worked in the kitchen. She and two other people decided to go hiking for the day. Now, at this retreat center, any time you go hiking, because it's deep in a national forest, you have to sign a log of when you left, where you were going, and when you expected to return. And every night, they check the log to make sure everyone got back. That night, they didn't return. A huge blizzard came in. It snowed and snowed and snowed. They couldn't see three inches in front of their face. When you go backpacking in the mountains, there's a list called the 10 essentials that everyone is told to take along. Stuff like water, a way to make fire, food, shelter, warmth. If you have all 10 of these things, you can survive. Well, it turns out these three young women, as they got trapped in the snow, realized each of them only had nine <laughs> of the 10 essentials. But they stayed together, and they found some trees, they found some branches, they were able to put together a little bit of a shelter, and they went in there together, and they snuggled up, and they made it through the night, and they were found the next morning. And the rescuers who found them said, you know, if there'd only been two or one of you, you would not have had enough warmth to avoid hypothermia. You would have died last night. They also said that most often, someone always goes off, the team breaks up, because someone's got a better idea of how to do it, and if any one of them had left, they all would have died. The three-ply braid is not easily broken. Relationships are what make us happy. Relationships are what make us thrive. Being connected to God, being connected to friends and family, being tied together in a strong braid of love and connection and belonging. Next week, I invite you to come back as we continue to talk about the happiness that comes out of our relationships. And we'll look at how we build relationships with God and the people around us that produce completeness and well-being through the practice of forgiveness. And the third week, we will look at how we live a life that generates happiness through acts of contentment and gratitude that we express through our relationships. While our reading from Ecclesiastes today was a dark moment for the writer, the end of the story is that all is not futile and despairing, but rather when we are bound together in love, then we find happiness. Amen.